Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. We do that by bringing in guests who have scientific backgrounds and also Christian apologists to share with us their expertise and their study. Today I have one of my very favorite guests with me, Dr. David Menton, who for many years was a professor in the medical school at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Menton, it's always great to have you with us. Pleasure. Now we're going to talk today about one particular person uh, in uh, quotes, Lucy, she's no lady. You don't love Lucy, do you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, tell us who she is and uh, why she's drawing so much attention. Well, I think if you had to pick one example of an ape man, it would turn out, uh, according to evolutionists, to be an ape woman. And uh, that's Lucy. Uh, it's probably the one fossil we call these hominids that are uh, believed to be ancestors of humans today. And uh, one thing we can say about Lucy is that uh, uh, this individual looks very much like an ape. In fact, it's kind of intriguing. When I say, Lucy, she's no lady, I mean that literally we now have pretty good evidence that this fossil primate is a male, <laughs> not a female. So that pretty well <laughs> documents our premise right off the bat. But in addition, you're going to tell us that not only is she not a, a woman or female, but she, she also is no human. Is that right? Right. You see, there's a whole cast of characters, Don, that are supposed to be uh, ancestors of humans uh, in the fossil record. But as Richard Lowenton said, who's an evolutionist at Harvard University, uh, this evidence that comes from the fossil record to try to show that this or that fossil is an evolutionary ancestor of man is not that reliable. To quote Dr. Lewinton, who is an evolutionist, he said, despite the excited and optimistic claims that have been made by some paleontologists, that's people who study fossils, no fossil hominid species can be established as our direct ancestor. One of the things that has been hardest for me to accept is just the lack of evidence. Then after that, the lack of credibility might much of the evolutionary community. What we've done on the cover of Time magazine and other places to make the general public believe that we have this half-ape, half-human person is really very disingenuous, isn't it? Yes, but I have a recommendation for everybody, All and right. that is look carefully at the dotted line. Okay, show and us what you mean by that. <laughs> Watch the dotted. This is a typical type of chart that we might see, Don, in uh, many different journals. I kind of adapted this from uh, a couple of magazines. And uh, what it's supposed to show is this is the common ancestor back here, presumably of apes and humans. Now, what is so typically true is that notice as we follow the line up to living apes up here, it's just all dotted lines with a question mark on it, and there are no, there are no fossils in between. No, it's years. almost as if the evolutionists have told the apes, if you're interested in your ancestors, you go find your own. <laughs> uh, now, if we look along the line that leads to man, this is supposed to be us up here now, uh, that uh, does have some intermediate steps. But notice, as I mentioned, follow the dotted line. The dotted line means that these are speculations. Okay. This is not firm by any means. This is somebody's guesstimate of what might be the case. And we have various animals here. And you notice there's an A in front of all of these. That stands for Australopithecus, which basically means southern ape. So whatever else we can say about these creatures, they are apes. Okay. And the one we're going to talk about is Australopithecus afarensis. That's basically what we sometimes collectively call Lucy, although Lucy technically is just one particular fossil. But there are several specimens, presumably, of the same type of animal. And sometimes, rather than say Australopithecus afarensis, we just call them Lucy. Okay. And if you don't mind, I'm going to use that. I like that better. I can <laughs> say it. But it's Australopithecus afarensis that you see the dotted lines, meaning we really don't know. <laughs> with the question marks leading up finally to man. Let's look at the evidence. First of all, Lucy was discovered by a man named Donald Johansson. He found him in Ethiopia back in 1974. And uh, it was an unusual fossil uh, for a primate, that is an animal that has uh, 
uh, hands sort of uh, like we do with the thumbs and what have you. And uh, it was about 40% complete. Normally we find much less. Yeah. But uh, you can see from the picture over here that there are enough bones here to pretty much put together the idea of a skeleton. A little bit of the skull, nothing of the feet, just a little bone or two from the hands. We have the upper part of the leg here and the lower part there, so we can kind of interpret that. There are ribs and vertebra, arms. And uh, what we can say about this is that Lucy, based on other fossils that have been found, clearly had an ape skull. But it's argued that the rest of the body was somewhat like man. Let's look at that. Here is the skull very much the ape type skull, very small cranial capacity. In fact, they say Lucy had a pretty small brain even by ape standards. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't need to worry about this being human. Uh, but the big difference between apes and people just looking at a skull like this is that the human face is kind of more straight up and down. Yes. Whereas the ape face is at an angle. We call it a shovel type face. Ape, ape, ape. No question. Nobody really doubts that as far as the skull. But let's look at this statue that we have in St. Louis, uh, in the St. Louis Zoo. It's in an exhibit called The Living World. And in this exhibit, they show a mannequin uh, of a creature about uh, three feet tall. Okay. And uh, I've watched the children go through the zoo with their teacher, and they say, oh, look, Miss Ferguson, or whatever the name might be, uh, an ape man. Because up here they see an ape head, no question about that, they have an ape head in this very lifelike mannequin, but all of the rest of the body is very human-like, just hairy. Uh, the trunk, the breast, genitalia, arms, hands, legs, feet, posture, gait, and even the pensive gaze. The artist that made this statue has Lucy like this. And we know right away that suggests deep thought. The great thinker. There it right. is. Yes. Have you ever seen such deep thought in your life? <laughs> and also, look at the hands here. You could play piano with these hands, Don. Yep. The fingers are straight. They're Absolutely a little long. Absolutely human finger. Right. But they're straight. They're yes. definitely not the hands of an ape. And so straight fingers, whole hand being clearly ape-like, and that typically is the way Lucy has been portrayed. The interesting thing is that the zoo itself has admitted that they knew this was not really an accurate representation of this fossil when they made the mannequin. Then why did they do it? Well, they said it's not so important whether it's scientifically accurate or not. It's the impression that they want to make to the visitor to the zoo. So would you call that deliberately deceiving the people? <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to put you on a spot, but that's it what I would say. It shows the zeal to communicate the evolutionary dogma is so great that one is not particular and, about And, and uh, let's be specific. What they're really trying to do is get to the minds of our children. Absolutely. And to plant the seed that this is how it came about when they're young. But let's be fair to evolutionists now. Not all, all right. evolutionists are quite that sloppy. In fact, a lot of them are much better. Uh, a person by the name of Stern, another man by the name of Sussman, evolutionist publishing in the American Journal of Physiology here some years ago, pulled together everything we know about these kinds of creatures, like Lucy. And what they did was to look at the fingers, first of all, and to see how curved the fingers are, because apes have very curved fingers for grasping limbs, right. at least the tree-dwelling ones do. And so what they did is they compared Lucy's fingers or organisms like Lucy, to other living apes. Uh, and uh, this represents the curvature of the human right here. And as you go to the right, it means more curved. Okay. Here's a pygmy chimp. Here's a regular chimpanzee. Here's a gorilla. So they're much more curved than human. Here's Lucy. She's clear past the Right. All the this data, age. here it is. Well, this is the only data point that came even in the range of the apes. So in other words, what we can say is that Lucy or creatures like Lucy have highly curved claw-like fingers, heavily muscled, even by ape standards. Wow. Nothing like human. That was the conclusion of the authors. They said that the hands were surprisingly like those of a pygmy chimp. 
Well, let's look at another interesting fact that just emerged recently. They found out that not only did Lucy have hands like a pygmy chimp, but it's quite clear that Lucy, instead of walking around with looking in the air with pensive gaze, was actually a long-arm knuckle walker. <laughs> Apes that walk on their knuckles yeah. have locking wrists so that their wrist doesn't bend. We have locking knees, so our knees don't right. bend. Knuckle walkers have locking wrists, and Lucy was a knuckle walker. is clearly a knuckle walker. Not exactly the pianist you saw in your Not uh, the way they portray right. it in the museum. Yeah. Now look at these feet, <laughs> Don. Crack me up. Have you ever I'm seen sorry. a foot like that? <laughs> yeah. Just kick off a shoe. You'll see a foot like that. Maybe right. not that hairy. These are human feet. Yes, they are. What do we know? Lucy didn't have feet that were even remotely like this. No. Back again to Stern and Sussman. They looked at the curvature of the toes, and the long and short of it is, just as we saw before, here's the curvature way out here for Lucy. This is the human way back here. These are apes in the middle. So she had even more curvature than the apes. Yes. Both the toes and the, and the feet are heavily muscled, very curved, and the hands have locking wrists. No reason whatever to show Lucy like so. No. Well, it uh, actually even gets worse than this as we go along. <laughs> Discover magazine here a few years ago kind of summarized what they think we know about Lucy, and they asked the question, how did we start walking on two feet? And look at the feet that they put on Lucy. Here we go. These are human feet attached to Lucy. Let's uh, blow them up a little bit where you can... Uh, get a better view here. Human feet on Lucy. Why on earth did they do that? The reason they did that is very interesting. Because you see Mary Leakey some years ago, back in 1972, uh, discovered some footprints in uh, Latole, which is in Tanzania. And there were 73 feet long trail here uh, with quite a few uh, footprints in them. And they showed the distinct left-right stride Mm -hmm. of three humans walking along. These footprints were absolutely identical to living human footprints, except she believes, as evolutionists believe, that these footprints are four million years old, which would put them back three to four million years back, according to evolutionary speculation, at the time of Lucy. So Lucy's discoverer says, you know what? An animal like Lucy made these footprints. Even Dr. Leakey disagrees with that because she knows the foot of Lucy could never make this print. You know, this is a distinctly human footprint. The toe up here uh, goes out straight. Uh, the foot hugs the ground. When our foot hits the ground, the, the heel hits first and the pressure follows this pathway you see right there. It goes along the outside of the foot across the base of the toe and pushes off from the big toe. Right. No ape walks like that. Can't. And yet, that's the footprint she found. And they want to put Lucy's foot into this print. And there's no way Lucy's foot's going to fit in this print. You know what it's like? It's like uh, Cinderella and the Wicked Stepsisters. Is that right? You know, they had to get the, the foot Put, in the glass slipper, the and yeah. you just have to force. But I'm sorry, the, the forcing just isn't going to do a whole lot of good. Another thing we hear a lot about is the knee joint on this. Well, before we move from the foot to the knee, uh, we need to take a break. So you stay there and, and tell us about that knee as soon as we get we'll back. We'll get right to it. Friend, you want to stay with me because we're going to wrap this up. And uh, by the end of the show, I think all of you are going to agree that Lucy's no lady. We'll be right back. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Random mutations. Fabulous fossil folly. According to evolutionists, we exist because random mutations turn simple organisms into more complex creatures. If so, where are all the leftovers and mistakes? Where are all the fossils showing evolution? Through the years, we've been exposed to many hoaxes, but we haven't found one evolutionary fossil. Instead, we see millions of fossils that actually indicate creation of many distinctly different species at one time. Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. 
Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you're interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky, 41048. Or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org. We're back with Dr. David Mint, and we're talking about Lucy, this uh, uh, skeleton that was found, and why she's no lady. Dr. Menton, you were just about to get to the knee. Now, this is a piece of evidence that the evolutionists put in high regard, isn't it? Yes, this is actually a piece of evidence that seems to favor the view that Lucy maybe had some ability to walk upright. You see, humans are not kneed. Yeah. Our femurs come in like this, and then the rest of our leg goes straight down. We have what's called a carrying angle, mm -hmm. and Lucy has that too. You see, the femur comes down here, and then it makes an angle here, and then the rest of the way it goes straight. And this angle right here is called the carrying angle, or the valgus. The advantage of that is it keeps our weight over our feet. If we didn't have that, if our legs were straight, our feet would be further apart, mm -hmm. and we'd have to waddle more when we walk the way apes do. So a gorilla has zero angle there, it okay. was straight. And here's Lucy with a, a, with a pretty substantial carrying angle. In fact, humans have a nine degree carrying angle, uh, as you see up here. Humans have a nine degree angle right in here uh, from straight, they differ nine degrees. The gorilla has zero, the chimp has zero. Wow, and Lucy has 12. She has 12. 12 degrees, you see, or actually 15, 15. some would argue. Yeah. So uh, a pretty significant carrying angle. And that's argued that that shows she was able to walk upright as we do. The problem is we have living apes <laughs> that have pretty high carrying angles. In fact, the orangutan has a nine degree. The spider monkey has nine degree, both very comparable to what man has. We might ask, what are these apes doing with this carrying angle? Perhaps dancing ballet or something? Maybe. No, you see the apes that live in the trees and walk on limbs have to keep their feet together. To walk you can't have your feet wide apart and walk on a limb. And so uh, that makes them suitable for walking on limbs in the trees. So this carrying angle, the short lesson here, is that it doesn't necessarily imply anything with regard to Lucy being an ancestor of it man. It is something we have walking. in common, but it doesn't really make we any application. We have apes around today that have that sort of a angle. Well, uh, this is uh, going back to that article in the Discover magazine. And the thing that kind of pleased me in the Discover magazine is although they didn't get the feet right, they put human feet on her. We know that isn't right. What they did get right, however, is right here. They got the hands. They got the hands right, and they got the hip right. And that's important. Look at these hands. You're not playing piano with this. This is what we call meat hooks. Yeah. <laughs> You can hang from a limb on a tree very nicely with this, yeah. and you can knuckle walk <laughs> yeah. with those kind of hands. But forget about piano. Okay. You know, to walk the way we walk, Don, you have to have the kind of hips we have. Okay. Uh, our hip bones up here under the belt go front to back. And on an ape, the hip bones go out to the side. Look at Lucy. The hip bones stick out each side. They do not come around to the front. Let's look at a diagram of what that's like. Here's a chimp. Notice that the hip bones go out to the side. But on humans, those same bones, it's called the iliac bone, comes around to the front almost like a steering yoke on an airplane. And only with hips like this are you able to walk and make the kind of footprints that we see in Latoli, which as far as I can see, clearly made by human beings. And of course, I don't believe they're four million years old either. Well, on that note, we, uh, I would conclude that uh, Lucy is certainly not a lady. In fact, the evidence now is that Lucy was actually a male uh, ape and uh, certainly not something becoming human. Why do we make such a big deal out of finding a fossil of an ape that's clearly an ape? 
It would seem, Don, that man very badly wants to believe that he has come from a bestial or animal ancestry. If we can believe that, apparently the payoff or the plus side of that is that we really are then no longer accountable to a creator. After all, we're just animals. If we behave like animals, if we uh, uh, come up with our own morals and values and what have you, uh, we are not accountable to a creator. We just take our bias to our digs with us and find evidence that suits us, or if the evidence doesn't suit us, we try to make it suit, and then we convince our kids of that. That's right. I'm not arguing, Don, that everyone who believes in evolution behaves like some sort of animal or no. anything, but it does free up man from accountability to a creator. Absolutely. You know, we can look at the effect of this kind of mentality uh, on certain individuals. And it's pretty sobering. I'm sure you've heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. I sure have. Uh, he was interviewed on the Stone Phillips show here a few years ago. And on the show, this is what he had to say, and it's, I think, pretty sobering. If a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to uh, keep it within acceptable ranges? And his behavior was not in an acceptable range. He killed people and ate them. That's right. He well, goes on to say, that's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we died, you know, that was it, nothing. What this is saying to us is that ideas have consequences. And when we teach that we have, as Jeffrey said, we're just slime plus time, that there is no creator, therefore there is no purpose, therefore there's no law, there's no right and wrong, so I can make up my own rules. And if I want to eat you and I don't get caught, then that's my business and, uh, and there's no one to say that's wrong. Uh, this material that we're pumping into the minds of our children is so dangerous because it removes all sense of accountability to the God who made us. I think we could conclude that ideas have consequences. That's right. And the ideas that God gives us in Scripture have consequences in the ideas of man that we are just a beast, that we are accountable to no one, that we decide for ourselves what's right and wrong can lead to some pretty disastrous results. So the worldview that you have become lenses through which you look at the evidence. And if you look at Lucy and you really, really want to find that missing link, you'll do whatever you need to do to, to make her fit, even though he, she's a he and she's a chimp. Uh, but if you put on any sense of objectivity, Lucy becomes rather irrelevant to any scientific discovery, doesn't it? You know, there's a story about a, a human evolutionist who dug up a small fragment of a mandible, immediately determined that it was an ape-like ancestor of man, and he was so excited, he says, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. That's a great line. <laughs> you know, my friends, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Minton for coming and sharing this with us, his scientific insight into uh, how people are made and, and what makes us human is, uh, is a tremendous uh, blessing for all of us as we look through his eyes at the evidence regarding Lucy. I want to uh, caution you as you're looking at textbooks with your children, as you're looking at the Time magazine that comes into your home, be a little skeptical. Uh, look for those dotted lines and look for those subtle sentences that try to take uh, theory and make them appear as fact. You know, my friends, here at uh, at, at Origins, we believe with all our heart that the fact is God made us. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your opinion on Lucy and, and uh, this whole idea of the missing link. Why don't you write to me at Origins, Cornerstone Television, Wall PA, 15148, or on the web, get a hold of us at OriginsTV.org. We really value hearing from you. And, but in the meantime, I want you to remember that we have these two conflicting worldviews, and it's God's view that he made you, and that should be your worldview too. So until the next time, God bless you.
thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 817 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 817, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.